We'll now proceed with our discussion of gross anatomy of the adult, and we will start off with a discussion of the back and nervous system. Now, what we will cover first is uh, the vertebral column, and then we'll take a look at the intervertebral discs and some issues related to them. We'll look at the spinal nerve, and then we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the autonomic nervous system. Now, of course, the vertebral column is made up of a series of individual vertebrae, and we can see a typical vertebra here with a vertebral body in the anterior part, the vertebral arch in the posterior part. The vertebral arch is made up of the two pedicles and the two laminae that meet in the midline. And then emerging from the vertebral arch, we have some processes, transverse processes. Muscles will attach to those. A spinous process posteriorly, muscles will attach to that. And we'll have some processes coming off the top and bottom of the vertebra, which can be seen better on this lateral view. And those will be the articular processes that will allow for the uh, formation of joints between the adjacent vertebrae. So when we put these individual vertebrae together, we end up with our vertebral column. And the view on the left is an anterior view looking at the vertebral column from the front. And what we can see from that view primarily the vertebral bodies and the intervertebral discs between those vertebral bodies. Now the major function of that part of the vertebral column is to support weight. The vertebral bodies are designed and the discs are designed to support weight. That being the case, it's not a surprise that when we look at the column, we see that the size of these vertebral bodies and discs get progressively larger as we descend along the column, since the further down the column you go, the more and more superimposed weight we, you have to support. So the bodies and discs get larger to support greater weight. However, once we pass below the first sacral vertebra, we see a sudden reversal of that pattern and whereas these structures have been getting larger and larger up until that point, very quickly they get smaller. And that's explained nicely by the fact that at the level of about the first sacral vertebra is where we have the sacroiliac joint seen in the lateral view here. And at the sacroiliac joint, weight is being transferred from the vertebral column across the joint to the pelvis and then from the pelvis down to the lower limb. So below that level, it's the pelvis and lower limb that is supporting weight, not the vertebral column, and therefore we see this dramatic change in structure to reflect that change in function. Now when we turn our attention to the posterior part of the vertebral column, the part made up of the vertebral arches, the function of that part of the column is quite different. That's designed to protect the spinal cord and related nerves. So within the vertebral arch, there's a canal called the vertebral canal that runs down the length of the vertebral column. And inside that vertebral canal, surrounded by the bony vertebral arch, is the spinal cord and surrounding meninges. Since the spinal cord is inside of the vertebral column, and since the spinal cord has spinal nerves emerging from it, and those spinal nerves have to get to the rest of the body outside of the vertebral column, there needs to be a pathway for those spinal nerves to get out. And what we see is a series of openings called intervertebral foramina, the openings between the vertebrae. And it's through these intervertebral foramina that the spinal nerves exit. So what we can say is that what's passing through each intervertebral foramen or what's occupying the intervertebral foramen is a spinal nerve. And that's going to be an important relationship. When we turn our attention to the posterior side of the vertebral column, we see another series of important openings, but only at the lumbar level. And those lumbar openings are called the interlaminar spaces. Since this surface of the vertebra is called the lamina, the spaces between the laminae are called interlaminar spaces. <clears throat> now, they really only exist at lumbar levels because at lower levels, the sacral laminae are fused together, so there are no spaces. 
and at higher levels, the laminae overlap one another, thereby covering over the space. So it's only at lumbar levels that we actually have interlaminar spaces. And those interlaminar spaces are important because they're used clinically as our pathway for doing lumbar puncture. So let's uh, turn our attention for a moment to discuss lumbar puncture. Firstly, since this interlaminar space is fundamentally the target to which, at which we're aiming when we want to pass a needle into the vertebral canal, we want that target to be as large as possible. So we want to increase the size of an interlaminar space when doing a lumbar puncture, and the way we can accomplish that is by having the patient in a flexed position. By flexing the vertebral column, you're getting one lamina from the next, thereby increasing the size of the interlaminar space. So the lumbar puncture is done in the posterior midline with the vertebral column uh, flexed.